So I'd like to now introduce the, what I think is the most important part of any TAMIS conference, where we recognize outstanding achievements by young researchers in medicine, engineering, science, and technology innovation. These awards play an important role in advancing TAMIS' goal of recognizing and promoting rising star researchers in the state. The awards are named in honor of Edith and Peter O'Donnell, who have been steadfast supporters of TAMIS since its inception and are among the state's staunchest advocates for excellence in higher education and research. The awards are supported through the O'Donnell Endowment, and we'd like to acknowledge and thank the O'Donnell Endowment donors for their generous contributions to this endowment, which allows us to give these awards. The awards committee is composed of 12 TAMIS members serving on four different committees, one for each of the awards. There were a total in 2019 of 58 nominations for the awards, for the four awards, 16 of which were renominations. So renominations seem to uh, occur quite a bit. It's a very competitive award system. Subcommittees select finalists to advance the external review stage where National Academy's members outside of Texas review the finalists' materials and submit their comments to help make the decision for the subcommittees and for the committee as a whole. The Technology Innovation Committee, uh, which I had, naturally has a different procedure. Uh, we conduct a site evaluation uh, visits to the sites of, of the finalists, um, and the competition is quite severe. The majority of awards recipients have been nominated in previous years, as I've said. After a thorough review of the candidates, the awards committee recommends the re awards recipients to be submitted to the Nobel Laureates Committee. The Nobel Laureates Committee is chaired by Dr. Joseph Goldstein, who reviews the recommended recipients and submits their endorsement to the TAMIS board for the final approval. So there are many steps that go through to get this award. We would like to thank all of the awards committee and Nobel Laureate Committee members who participated uh, this year. Uh, there was quite a bit of work. Each of the medals that's awarded has a distinct pattern reflective of the discipline. And these awards are presented to the recipients at the annual O'Donnell Awards Dinner, which will be held later this evening. And there's a big treat. We always have a nice video. Uh, for those of you like me who are going to have trouble understanding the technology that they're presenting, the video will help later on. <laughs> OK. As the committee chair for the 2019 uh, O'Donnell Awards Committee, I'm proud to announce the award recipients, and, and perhaps you can come up here and sit. It'll make it quicker later on, okay, in order of their uh, presentations. For the category of medicine, it's Dr. Ralph D. Berardinas, the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. For engineering, Dr. Hal Alper of the University of Texas at Austin. For science, Dr. Julie Pfeiffer, the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. And for technology innovation, Dr. Terrence F. Alger, the second from Southwest Research Institute. You can always tell the technology innovation guy has a slightly different uniform. <laughs> the first presentation uh, today will be from uh, Dr. Ralph D. Berardinas from UT Southwestern. He is uh, chief of the Division of Pediatric Genetics and Metabolism at UT Southwestern and director of the Genetic and Metabolic Disease Program at Children's Medical Center Research Institute at UT Southwestern. He is a pioneer in studying how altered metabolism leads to diseases in humans. His work in cancer metabolism has changed our understanding 
of how tumors reprogram metabolic pathways to maximize energy production and growth. Discoveries from Dr. DeBardinas have opened new avenues of study for therapies and imaging techniques. After this presentation, we'll have an opportunity for questions uh, from one of the microphones in the room. Dr. DeBardinas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's really great to be here. I want to thank Tamist and the O'Donnell Endowment um, and the Selection Committee for this, um, this great honor. And it's really a delight to be able to tell you about Four some of our... So my lab is interested in the role of altered metabolism in disease. Um, proper control of metabolism is required for normal tissue function and health. And many diseases are caused by mutations that perturb metabolism. Uh, we know a lot about metabolism already, but in order to understand it in full, we really need to know how it responds to perturbation. And these diseases are a great opportunity to understand perturbations relevant to human health, but uh, it's challenging to study them where they really need to be studied, which is in a sick patient. And um, that's what we try to do. We identify perturbed metabolic states in human diseases, determine how those states promote disease, develop new ways to treat disease by normalizing metabolism, and we try as hard as we can to study metabolism directly in patients because we think that gives us the best opportunity for uh, meaningful discoveries. And of course, we use experimental models too, but we try to do that only after the human studies have told us which pathways we should focus on. My lab works on two different types of metabolic disease, inborn errors in metabolism and cancer. And they are very different clinically, but in both cases, altered metabolism contributes to the phenotype. And crucially, uh, the disease can sometimes be treated by targeting the altered metabolic pathways. And that emphasizes the importance of thoroughly understanding the underlying metabolic uh, defect. So uh, I run a clinical program in inborn errors of metabolism. And uh, those diseases are important and fascinating because uh, they are essentially human knockouts of metabolic enzymes. So they link uh, discrete metabolic defects to human phenotypes. And what we do in the program is to identify children in the clinic that have unusual phenotypes. We characterize them in the lab using metabolomic profiling and genomics to try to identify new disease genes. And when we do that, we generate novel mouse models to try to understand disease mechanism and think about treatment. And um, we've recruited about 500 uh, subjects so far into the inborn errors study. And in many of those patients, we've been able to ident identify um, mutations in genes that had not been previously ascribed to human disease. Um, and so that is ongoing work. But for the rest of this short talk, on, short talk I'm going to focus on our work um, in cancer, because cancer is a metabolic disease, too. Uh, in culture, cancer cells take up lots of glucose and convert it into pyruvate uh, using a pathway called glycolysis. Non-malignant tissues oxidize pyruvate in the mitochondria in a pathway called the TCA cycle, which is the cell's central hub of energy production and biosynthesis. But at least in culture, cancer cells tend to convert the pyruvate into lactate and then secrete it through uh, these proteins called monocarboxylate transporters or MCT proteins. So uh, glucose is the fuel and lactate is the waste product. And that's a very famous metabolic phenomenon. It's called the Warburg effect. And if you know anything at all about cancer metabolism, you've probably heard of the Warburg effect because it's been around for a long time. It's literally the founding principle in cancer metabolism. It's been studied very extensively in culture, going all the way back to the work that Warburg himself did almost a century ago. But even after almost a century, its relevance to human tumors in vivo is unknown because the vast majority of our knowledge about cancer metabolism is, is it comes from uh, studies in cells grown in a Petri dish. And uh, that is a problem because tumor metabolism can't be fully modeled in culture. For one thing, tumors are mixtures, complex mixtures of multiple different cell types, and that's a far cry from the homogeneous populations of rapidly proliferating cancer cells that we study in culture. And second, all of these different factors uh, can regulate metabolism. And the fact of the matter is we don't have a good way to recapitulate all of these factors simultaneously in culture. And as a result, the pathways that are the most evident in tissue culture might not have anything to do with the metabolism of a tumor growing in a patient. So to summarize that, we need ways to probe tumor metabolism in vivo. 
and preferably in humans. And this is one of the things my lab has been working on for the last few years. And I'm going to show you some data about how we've established a method to analyze lung tumor metabolism directly in patients as the tumors are growing in the, in the chest of the patient. In, um, in patients that have solitary pulmonary lesions that are scheduled for surgical resection, we use quantitative imaging to phenotype the tumor. And then on the day of the surgery, the patient is infused with glucose that's labeled with a stable isotope called carbon-13. Okay, and that allows the tumor and the adjacent tissue to take up the glucose and to distribute the label downstream into metabolites as a consequence of the metabolic activity hap happening in the tissue. Then, uh, and that allows us to characterize metabolic fluxes that are occurring both in the tumor and in the adjacent tissue. The, um, the tumor and the adjacent lung is then resected by the, uh, by the surgeon, and we freeze the samples down, and then later we analyze all of those different parameters. And that allows us to compare metabolic activity between tumor and adjacent tissue, to correlate metabolic activity with those other um, aspects of tumor biology, and even to spatially localize metabolic activities uh, using the pre-surgical imaging. And so our first analysis of human lung tumors showed that really the tumors didn't look at all like the classical Warburg effect. For one thing, there was no suppression of the mitochondrial TCA cycle. In fact, the, uh, the pathway was activated in the tumors relative to adjacent lung. And that was particularly evident in areas of the tumors that had lots of proliferating cancer cells. And second, it was um, clear from the labeling data that the tumors were also consuming other fuels in addition to glucose. We're interested in what those fuels are because uh, they could provide clues about how to either target uh, cancer growth therapeutically or, or potentially ways to image, uh, image the tumors. And I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes describing one of those fuels to you. This is a cartoon that illustrates an important point about isotope labeling. And uh, the color of the box reflects the amount of the carbon-13 label in each metabolite. So in a simple pathway like this, when the system comes to steady state and the labeling is no longer changing, the labeling, if the pathway is fed only by glucose, the labeling should be consistent or the color should be consistent throughout the pathway. But if other fuels that are unlabeled are also being consumed, uh, they, uh, their contribution dilutes labeling downstream of their entry in the pathway. And you get these partially labeled metabolites shown in light blue. Here's the data from um, our first cohort of lung cancer patients. Uh, on the y-axis, the relative amount of labeling in each metabolite compared to glucose, which is the source of carbon-13, is plotted. And then the metabolites are uh, laid out according to their position in the pathway, getting further from glucose as you go from left to right. So in the black line, that represents the labeling in all of, in all of the adjacent non-malignant lung tissue. And they follow this consistent and predictable pattern of label dilution, which is consistent with, uh, with the uh, incorporation of, uh, of unlabeled fuels. And about half of the tumors look pretty much exactly like the lungs. But the other half look really different. And they look different specifically because there's an unusual amount of high labeling in lactate relative to these upstream glycolytic intermediates, 3PG and PEP. So, um, you, you, so uh, that shouldn't happen because the lactate is supposed to be downstream, which means that its labeling should be the same or maybe less, but not higher. So you, kind of, you can't get here from there, as they say. Uh, and so that argues that there's some unexpected uh, source of label uh, entering the pathway. And so how do you explain that odd labeling? Well, it has to do with metabolism happening outside of the tumor. When you infuse carbon-13 glucose into a patient, all the tissues in the body get to take it up and metabolize it. And some of them convert the glucose into lactate, which now contains carbon-13, and that lactate circulates. If some of it goes into the tumor, then you get a labeling pattern where the labeling is high and then low and then high again. So high, then low, then high again. And that led to the hypothesis that lactate was being used as a fuel in these tumors. And that's a testable hypothesis. You just change the clinical protocol so that now you infuse carbon-13 lactate instead of carbon-13 glucose, and then resect the tumor and analyze carbon-13 labeling. In this experiment, there's two ways for the carbon-13 to go into the tumor. First, uh, through the red pathway involving entry through these MCT proteins, or through the gray pathway where lactate is converted to glucose in the liver, and then glucose enters via, via the gray pathway. 
Um, but it's the relative amount of label in these red intermediates compared to the gray intermediates that reports the dominant route of entry uh, into the tumor. And it was quite clear from the data that um, there's very little entry of carbon coming from the, the gray pathway, whereas the red intermediates shown here are more highly labeled. And that indicates that lactate is transmitting label into the tumor via the red pathway. Now, I mentioned before that tumors are complex mixtures of malignant cells and non-malignant cells. We wanted to test whether cancer cells themselves can take up uh, lactate and use it as a fuel. And so in order to do that, we generated uh, xenograft tumors in mice derived from a cell line that transports lactate through this protein called MCT1. We engineered these cells in culture to lack MCT1 using CRISPR, and then we uh, implanted the tumors, uh, the, the cells, grew tumors, and infused the mice with carbon-13 lactate, and then analyzed C13 labeling from metabolites that were extracted from the tumor. Now, in this experiment, if the cancer cells themselves are taking up lactate, the MCT1 knockout tumor should have blunted labeling. And that's what happened. You can see here in the controlled tumors the high level of labeling in all of these intermediates during a lactate infusion. And that labeling is essentially eliminated if you knock out MCT1. And that shows that cancer cells themselves can take up lactate from the circulation and use it as a carbon source. So that's not the Warburg effect. That's, uh, in some ways, the opposite of the Warburg effect, because we can't fit the data unless you incorporate this arm where lactate is being used as a carbon source to feed the TCA cycle. And that indicates that lung tumors, as they grow in patients, are not particularly Warburg-like. They're actually quite oxidative. And they consume multiple fuels, which include glucose and lactate and probably other fuels as well. So lung tumors uh, in humans are, um, are oxidative. And the next question then was, how does that compare to other tumors growing in other parts of the body in patients? So the nice thing about these uh, C13 infusions is that they're versatile. And you can infuse patients with uh, many different types of cancer, as we've now done uh, around UT Southwestern and about a, a dozen different types of cancer. And because the labeling um, technique is consistent from study to study, you can begin to compare the labeling data from one type of cancer to another type of cancer. And I'm just going to close in the last couple of minutes by showing you a couple of pieces of data about this type of cancer, clear cell renal cell carcinoma, or CCRCC, because it provides contrast with what I just told you about lung tumors. So uh, CCRCC is the most common form of kidney cancer in patients. And this is the tumor from one of our patients. It's been butterflied open. You can see the kidney here. And the tumor is this large mass that looks pale because of the uh, intense amount of lipid deposition that's characteristic of this disease. In fact, the name clear cell comes from the histology. The, cell, the cancer cells in these tumors have this abundant, clear-appearing cytoplasm because of uh, all the lipid de deposition. And that's thought to be um, a, uh, an aspect of reprogramming of glucose metabolism. That reprogramming is hardwired by the genetics of these, uh, of these tumors, we think, because essentially all CCRCCs lose the tumor suppressor uh, protein, which is called VHL. Normally, what VHL does is to suppress the activity of hypoxia-inducible transcription factors, or HIF proteins. And um, in the absence of VHL, these hypoxia transcri transcription factors are constitutively active, and that drives the expression of enzymes that increase glycolysis and suppress oxidation of pyruvate. That is the normal physiological response to hypoxia. But what happens in the context of VHL loss is that the cells do that all the time. They're hardwired to do that because they've lost a VHL. Now, if, uh, we know this from preclinical models. But if that's also true in patient tumors, then the tumors really should have a Warburg effect. They should have high enrichment of the glycolytic intermediates and low enrichment in the Krebs cycle. So the data here show um, labeling data from CCRCC tumors compared to adjacent benign uh, kidney tissue, and um, also from the, uh, the lung tumors in the normal lung that I showed you before. The key piece of uh, information here is that the glycolytic intermediates are higher in the kidney tumors than they are in the adjacent kidney, whereas you don't see that in the lung. Uh, and these tumors, the lung tumors, we think, are less glycolytic. The lactate labeling is also interesting. It's no higher in the, um, in the tumor than it is in the kidney. But that's not because of low labeling in the tumor. It's because the kidney is highly labeled. And you can see that there's a step up between the labeling of the glycolytic intermediates 
um, when you get to lactate in the kidney. That's because we think the lactate is also taking up circulating labeled uh, lactate, whereas the kidneys don't do that. The tumors, rather, don't do that. They have consistent labeling throughout the pathway, and that's consistent with activation of glycolysis. The TCA cycle metabolites show exactly the opposite pattern with suppressed labeling in the TCA cycle intermediates in the, uh, in the CCRCCs relative to the normal kidney, whereas you see an enhancement of labeling in those metabolites in the tumor. So that is all to say that um, the kidney tumors um, are glycolytic, and, uh, and the lung tumors uh, are not particularly glycolytic. Actually, that's, the, that's even easier to see if you normalize the labeling data to labeling in pyruvate, which is right upstream of the TCA cycle. In this normalized data, I'm showing you information that comes from uh, CCRCC in red, and then in tumors that come from uh, the brain or the lung of patients shown in blue and gray. And in the tumors growing in the brain and the lung, you see propagation of, uh, of the labeling between pyruvate and the TCA cycle intermediates, and that's because those tumors are oxidizing pyruvate as a carbon source in the TCA cycle, whereas in the kidney tumors, you lose half of the labeling between pyruvate and citrate, and that's because of a loss of, of oxidative metabolism. We think that's all regulated by VHL, and we'll be able to test that now using, using uh, uh, mouse models of, of CCRCC. So to summarize, um, I told you about a, a technique that um, allows us to uh, uh, assess metabolic activities directly in human tumors from patients. And um, that technique allows us to identify aspects of cancer metabolism that we can't observe in culture. And it also is sensitive to uh, differences in cancer metabolism between different types of, of cancer in patients. Tumors that grow in the brain and the lung are oxidative. They uh, burn fuels like glucose and lactate in the TCA cycle, whereas uh, clear cell renal cell carcinomas are highly glycolytic. And I point out that difference simply because uh, when we started the project, uh, the, the Warburg effect really dominates um, both uh, the cancer cell metabolism and culture and the cancer metabolism literature. So I think it's, it's interesting that so far the... Um, uh, the suppression of oxidative metabolism that is predicted by the Warburg effect uh, really seems to be the exception rather than the rule. So going forward, uh, the, the most pressing um, question for us now is to uh, use this technique to identify aspects of tumor metabolism that support cancer progression. All of the data I've shown you so far has come from primary treatment-naive tumors. Those tumors tend to be localized and are often sensitive to conventional therapy. The problem, though, is that the tumor recurs, and when it recurs, either as a, um, uh, as a, as a new mass in the same organ or as um, a disseminated uh, uh, metastatic cancer, the cancer has changed, and it is no longer sensitive to uh, the therapies that, uh, that, that killed the cancer cells um, earlier. And so our challenge now is to see whether we can use this technique to identify um, the metabolic pathways that allow the patient to go from here to there. So we've changed our clinical protocol to now allow us to observe how the metabolic phenotype of the cancer uh, evolves over time. And we use mouse models now to ask whether targeting those pathways uh, improves survival. So I'll stop there. I would like to thank everybody in my lab who's contributed to this work, but in particular, Brandon Faubert and Dibia Beswada, who uh, provided the data in lung cancer and kidney cancer that I showed. We have outstanding uh, scientific and clinical collaborators around UT Southwestern, and, uh, and I'd also like to thank my sources of support. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Ralph, I just have one question, and that is, do you think you'll be able to distinguish a priori when you know there's a primary tumor of one type versus another, whether it's using the Warburg effect or the, I'll coin the term, the DeBerardinus effect. <laughs> yeah. You mean before doing the isotope tracing? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned uh, briefly that we use all of this quantitative imaging. This really is, as it turns out, to be an engineering problem. Some of the aspects of the imaging, particularly the degree to which different areas of the tumor are perfused, are predictive of the, let's say, lactate avid versus glucose uh, avid phenotype. And so uh, we need more data, but I'm hopeful that um, at some point we'll be able to 
either use uh, the imaging techniques that we're already using or possibly additional non-invasive techniques like a lactate PET tracer that would allow us to differentiate those tumors without having, having to do the carbon-13 infusion each time. Ralph, um, just regarding the, um, <clears throat> I, it sort of relates to the, to the question Davo asked, but I, I'm wondering, first of all, how confident you are that you're not gonna see more heterogeneity even within a tissue type within the tumor. And the second kind of relates to that, which would just be genetic mechanisms. So what you presume that there are transporters that might be upregulated and pathways that are that could also be identified as you sample tumors. You yeah. Know, to without even having to go through the labeling potentially. I don't know. Right. Uh, I mean I I think we don't know how predictive uh, all of these diff the different um, pre-surgical techniques are going to be until, until we've acquired more data. However, um, it's clear that every aspect of um, every parameter that I described is heterogeneous even within individual tumors. The imaging features are heterogeneous. The metabolic features are heterogeneous. And so I'm encouraged by the fact that often the metabolic features um, correlate with, uh, with the imaging features. That's important because, um, although I didn't show you the data, some of the metabolic features um, predict how aggressive the tumor will be. And if we can hone in on tumors that contain, where at least part of the tumor uh, expresses that metabolic phenotype, then that would potentially allow you to stratify different tumors into different therapies. Very good. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.